So welcome everyone. I'm Emily Morris. I'm the Director of Artistic Development here at Andromedist. And I am very happy to see so many interested people in Andromedist and in our admissions process and the adjustments we've made to it. I've been asked uh, to tell you to be aware that this event is being live streamed on the internet through New Play TV and that as an audience member who asks the question, your voice or image may be recorded. So we tried this last year, it was successful, we're doing it again. Thanks to Warren and Allen, our Director of Finance and New Media, and uh, thank you to New Play TV. I just want to um, uh, introduce um, the lovely panel here. We're expecting a playwright, Daniel Wright, who just finished his seven-year residency, but who uh, agreed to come back and sort of be able to represent the playwright's point of view on this process. Um, answer any questions you have from a player's point of view about what the found this is, what it's like to be on the admissions committee. Um, and so we're going to introduce uh, the panel here, and then I would love to just go around and have you just say your names. I'm interested in knowing who we're sharing with. So, um, so we'll go here to my left. So I'm John Stieber. I'm the director of the Player Race Lab. I'm Tom Lundgren. I'm the artistic director. Andrea Lipsy. Laura Eric Augenbaugh. Christine Farrell. Eric Meyer. Tammy Bryan. Josh Bailey. Ray Nelson. Zach Klein. James Tyler. Uh, David Lockman. Jeffrey Stangerstein. Eric, yeah. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> David Allen. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. So we're going to try to do our best to um, to open up the process to all of you, to demystify how it works, and also uh, to answer any questions you have about how it works and or what it means to be a resident playwright at Nagrombe. So um, while we'll do an overview about the process, the new adjustments, I hope that we can quickly get into a dynamic conversation. Uh, and field questions from you, and we'll have some from um, the people. Help, help, help me. I don't know. But yes, from the from um, from the new TV. Yes. Yeah. Um, so. yeah. Hi, welcome. What's your name? Susan. Hi, Susan. Nostrand. Nostrand. Hi. Great. So over to you, Tom. Uh, yeah, start. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm Todd London, those of you who just came in. Uh, and uh, I want to give you a little overview of the process of the admissions process here. And I want to do it in the context of um, what this place is and what the uh, mission of this place is. Um, it's uh this is a now 63-year-old uh, center for the support and development Playwriting, playwrights particularly, um, we've never known too easily what to call it. It's partly a home base, it's partly a laboratory for writers, it's partly a community center, it is uh, an active and evolving community of playwrights. It goes back to 1949 when the world was really different for playwrights. Um, so uh, it is constantly uh, the, the offerings and the uh, uh, spirit of the place are constantly being updated. It, there's constantly evolving depending on who the resident playwrights here are. We currently have about 50 resident playwrights. It's not a set number. There's not a set number of people who get in every year. Um, and so this year, for example, we lost uh, or we, we finished a seven year residency period with five playwrights. We accepted in six playwrights. And so the balance shifts from time to time. 
Um, it's uh, very important, I think, from the outset to know that the mission of this organization is to give playwrights space and time to develop as artists, to make whatever impact they can on the field, um, and that the context for that um, time is a community context. And specifically, it's a community of writers, uh, which I know some people still think is oxymoronic, but it's not. I mean, I <laughs> Um, so that the work at Andromedus happens in really two spheres. One is the individual sphere as each writer makes his or her way through the seven years here, really uh, directed by, by the playwright him or herself. So I'm the artistic director here, but in a great sense that's a misnomer because every writer is the artistic director of the process through his plays and decides he or she will work on, how they'll work on it, how they'll avail themselves of the programs we have here, how they'll use the staff, how they'll use the community of the other writers, how they'll use the buildings. And as you know, every writer has a very different life. Um, uh, and over a period of seven years, which is a, a huge period of time, those lives can change a great deal. The group can change, the family circumstances can change everything. Um, so, on one level, New Dramatist is about the playwright's development and growth. On another level, uh, New Dramatist is about how to um, function, lead, participate within, uh, be active within a community of other writers. And the underlying premise of this place, though it's not stated in our mission, is that writers are each other's greatest resources and that we make each other better. Example, your um, challenge to each other, your um, uh, collaboration, what you share, what you learn from each other is the strength of a place like this. So, at any given time, there are roughly 50 writers here, each in some different stage of development personally, artistically, professionally, um, and each in some different relationship to the community. Um, and playwrights use this place in many different ways. Some people use it entirely as a laboratory to develop and work over seven years. Some people use it as a community base. Some people use it as a stomping ground. Some people use it as a place to write on a daily basis. And some people, and most everybody uses it as a mix of things, and that makes changes over time. Um, so the admissions process, unlike the process of being selected to have a play done in a theater, even at a develop, another developmental organization, say the O'Neill, the Summer of the O'Neill, or Sundance, uh, or in other residency programs that are more limited in time, um, the uh, selection process here is really about intuiting a writer, their body of work, where it stands through a couple of plays, intuiting it through a couple of plays, um, trying to get a sense of where they might be uh, in career, how they might use this place, how they might uh, give back to this place. So really both, again, the individual development and the community aspect. Because not every writer would use neutralness or need neutralness, though sometimes you would think that it's only, oh, and this is Dan Rice, just, just finished his seven year residency, and he's trying to Just now. Just now. <laughs> no, not until after this it's his sneaky. <laughs> it's his sneaky way to get back in the building. <laughs> Um, so, um, so the process, the admissions process, really focuses on both of these things. Specifically and mostly, it focuses on the work, but it doesn't focus so much on a given play. As you know, you're going to submit two plays to New Dramatists. Um, those plays are written, are, are written, they're read, written by you. Uh, they are read by a panel of seven. I'll explain it in a minute. Um, uh, Late on in the process, we have it's a three meeting uh, process in terms of uh, roughly eight months of reading by the panel and three very long meetings. I'll explain that. So, you don't need to do specifics. Um, uh, over the course of that time, most of the work is focused on who is this writer given these plays and what kind of passion does this writer incite in the um, later on in the process, when the 
pool of applicants has been winnowed to finalists, then questions come up also about uh, the writer's state of interest, how would that person use this place, how would this person benefit from this place, why a community setting for this person's artistic development, and so on. Um, so everything that we do, unlike a producing theater, which does really focus on is this play for us, and maybe secondarily as this writer, um, this place is really about um, how excited does this particular group of people this particular year get excited about, uh, how excited does this group get about this particular writer at this moment in this world? Um, so the package that you submit are, is, is two plays, a statement of interest, and we're going to talk about the other parts later because we, we've just changed uh, the requirements to make it a small, smaller submission, actually. Um, and then some sort of CV or resume. Um, if a writer is from out of New York, or the New York area, um, there's an additional small statement about how they might use the place even though they, they have to travel to get here. Um, the process by which uh, you will be um, evaluated or um, made to catch people on fire, is more likely that, um, <laughs> is that there is a seven-person committee. It changes utterly every year. Staff is not on it, so we don't weigh in on any of the writers. We facilitate the process. We keep our big mouths shut. Uh, we often don't even give, I mean, we give some information if we know it, but often we don't. We never say, oh yeah, this person has applied 18 times before, or this person was a finalist last year, or anything like that. So it starts fresh every year, including the panelists. The panel is made up of three current new dramas resident playwrights, two alumni, and two outside theater professionals. Um, we, what we do do is we uh, constitute a committee. So we try to create a committee that is as eclectic and as diverse in as many ways as this place is, as we hope our world is, uh, and as we want the theater to be. So there is a geographical balance to the committee, there is age balance to the committee, there is gender balance, there is racial diversity, there is aesthetic eclecticism on the committee, and none of that is predictable. So inevitably, the most experimental writer is, you know, loves the most conventional uh, <laughs> application or the most classical <clears throat> one. Um, it, it, it has never, in 16 years, in my experience, I would say with maybe exceptions of maybe one or two very small parts of small conversations that people um, find themselves representing racially or ethnically in the process. Because the writers, by the time a writer gets to the end of this process, they are so damn good and so damn right for this place that those kinds of conversations, that, that the balance finds itself almost in that way. Um, so this committee changes every year. We stack the committee in a way to make sure that the people in the committee will really work on a consensus basis, because that's how it's done. There's there never any votes that are binding in the process. This group has to um, this group has to agree um, in the end and has to agree at every stage of the game. So if one person wants to let go of a playwright early on and somebody else wants to hold on to them, we hold on to them until they can all agree. At the end, uh, this group has to agree by consensus and not by any kind of numerical vote that this is the group that we are accepting. So it's a total crapshoot. It's got a lot of randomness built in. It's passion biased so that there can be writers that everyone on the committee really likes and they won't get in here year after year because they don't set two or three or four or seven people on fire in the same way that maybe somebody who half the committee hates their work, you know? So, there's, so it really is about passion, it's about interest, and it's about committee convincing the rest of the committee to go along with the consensus on each and then on every applicant. Um, we, are, we are limited numerically, not by, uh, not by a set number that we can bring in every year, but really by the resources that we're We're pretty much maxed out in terms of 
time, space, money, uh, availability of space, staff resources at this 50 number. Um, which I know in a place that lets in five to eight, say, in the course of a year, which has been my experience here over 16 years, it's never been less than five or more than eight. Um, it feels in some ways that each year is exclusive, very exclusive, but when I think about that we're giving you know, seven new resources to 50 playwrights every year of our existence, I think there is no theater or theater organization in this country that serves so many writers at one time, so fully, except to maybe uh, a company like Ashland or uh, Oregon Shakes that has been actors on staff and salaries. Um, so really, that, uh, I, I, will, I will get off this, but the, uh, so that's the panel process. The um, panel changes every year, we're trying to mix it up. They read uh, two plays, uh, uh, they alternate the plays. The, the panelists read ten plays every two weeks from October to May. In January they meet once, usually the meeting lasts between 12 and 15 hours, um, during which they cut the list down from Whatever 300 or 325 will apply to about 100 semi finalists. There's a meeting in eight, uh, March, late March, early April, where the semi the finalists are chosen, so it's cut down maybe from 100 to about 20. And then there's a meeting in uh, May, early May, during which uh, they come up with uh, a group of five, six, seven, eight, based on who, they can on, who they're really excited about. Um, the uh, statements of interest are not read until the finals, unless a panelist asks to read them. Uh, we found that, uh, and this will go to something I will say, in the past we've had recommendations, we find that they are almost never read in the process. Um, the CDs are rarely referred to, that the first two meetings are really about the work. It's random who gets who play the first time, though as your plays get more um, feedback uh, uh, reports from the writers, uh, we start to sort of uh, push the plays towards readers who we think will like them, actually, or get them in some way. As we, uh, especially Emily and Aaron, who run this process administratively, as they see um, sort of what the playwright is up to, we look for where the passion behind them might be. And that, again, is a passion. Um, so, uh, statements of interest are uh, uh, read at the end, and at the very end of the very end of the final process, we start to discuss things like citizenship, how the person would use the plays, whether they use it, whether they need it, whether this group makes a, a nice class that feels representative based on the um, implicit or explicit um, uh, sort of beliefs of the panel itself. There is no sense of what a new dramatist is. There's no sense that this is a place for emerging playwrights, or mid-career playwrights, or established playwrights. Some of that has happened by default over the years because it's really hard to get through that process. And so it, it tends to favor playwrights who are a little bit farther along in their careers who have two really strong plays, as opposed to one play that's really strong and one that shows a process. But again, every year somebody gets in who's like fresh off the boat, you know, and then somebody who's been playing plays for 20 years. So it's a really different process. It changes from year to year, but those structures are the same. New group of people, that particular equation of people, how they read, how they discuss, and how we work with them um, towards consensus. A quick question. Sure. You described two bodies. There was the panel and there was the committee. At what point? It's the same thing. Oh, I, same just, I used two words for the same thing. Yeah. Many panels. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Thank you. Intrepid readers. Intrepid mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> <People, laughs> souls. Like not the editing. People who can live with their spouses being really pissed at them for eight months. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Thank you. Is there any other need for clarification on that? We're going to move on because now I'm going to tell you what is going to change about the process. Essentially, everything about the procedure will remain the same. There are some administrative changes, 
some of which are rather significant. Uh, the first being that we're going to go completely paperless. So we have um, a module on our recently redesigned website through which all applicants will apply. Um, what you apply with will remain the same. It will be two, uh, actually it will be two full-length plays instead of two, two copies of two full-length plays, which is what the, the, the uh, paper full process included. Um, and so two, two full-length plays, your CV or bio, uh, an artistic CV or bio, and uh, a statement of interest. So that will all happen on the online process. We are no longer accepting any letters of recommendation. Um, they have always been optional in the past, and as Todd said, they have rarely um, had any influence in the process, except those that came from current resident playwrights, alums, or our board members. Um, the advantage to having a letter from one of those groups of people was that your A play and your B play you, you determine which play you want read first, which would be your A play, and then your B play would follow as you advance in the process. So the way it was done before with the letters of recommendation from a current resident playwright and alum or a board member was that both your A play and your B play would automatically go into circulation to two different readers in the first round. So that is actually no longer, um, we're not having letters of recommendation so there's uh, not 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 from anybody. What we uh, what we are going to do once we have a list of applicants is to circulate it to the current resident company and to alumni, and they can opt to advocate in favor of one writer to have both their A play and their B play read in the first round by two different readers. Uh, what we're going to do. Uh, that's very new is to have that first round. Um, the the, well, the reading will be without names attached. So in fact, while there's this advantage that comes from within the community, um, advocacy from a current resident playwright, no one will know whose play they're reading or if it's their A play or B play. It will just be read without names attached in that first round. Uh, names will be attached in the second, the semifinals. So that the means will then get introduced in the second and third round of the reading. And then the submission window, which used to be open for two months, July 15th to September 15th, is now open from August 1st until September 1st until 11.59 p.m. So it's in fact, note the minute. <laughs> uh, and so the window has, has shrunk to, to a one month. Um, so those are the changes. Sure. I want to just uh, say one thing about the recommendations, because I think it bears saying. Um, a, yes, as we both said, uh, recommendations aren't really read, and they have not been impactful in the process. B, um, I think we feel really strongly that playwrights are asked to get recommendations again and again and again, and that it's a drag on their relationships, and it's also a drag on the people who write them, especially if they're never read. Uh, which are who are our colleagues. I mean, I, I would say probably the people sitting up here would write about as many recommendations, not for this process, but for other things, as any four people, but excluding you, Dan, and this, uh, the staff here writes so many recommendations, and it is really, um, uh, it, it takes a lot of time. So if it doesn't have bearing on the process, it just doesn't seem fair to anybody. Um, Yes. I also just want to say, I don't know, I, I want to also say that these changes, just because it gives it, it, it gives a, um, a glimpse into the way New Promise works uh, at organizationally, that all these changes were made with the input of the writers. We have a writer's executive committee, it's a volunteer body of governance and policy making um, playwrights within the community, to whom we take sort of really significant matters too for feedback and or their decision making. And so this was all d done with their input, with their suggestions, with their, and with their, ultimately their blessing that this was in fact a great direction to go as, you know, from a playwright's point of view as well as the organization's <coughs> point of view. So I just wanted to say, to say that, that this was, um, 
you know, did, there was something that they, they grew out of the administrative process, but it would only happen with the input of the writers and their you know, blessing to move forward in this manner. Another thing about the blind reading in the first mm -hmm. round, um, just the question that comes to my mind is why don't we do it throughout? And I think there are a couple of reasons that I just want to be really clear about. One is, um, it's never really blind. Once you get down to the people who are getting into the semifinals and finals, it's inevitable that somebody on the committee knows their work. I mean, it just is inevitable. And so, uh, whereas blind, the blind reading in the first round seems to give a kind of equity across the board, ultimately, um, it felt too dicey to let some people be known and some unknown. And, and secondly, on the community level and the sort of citizen, face and career level of this place, it didn't make sense to bring people in blindly. You know, it didn't make sense to forestall or cut off that conversation about what benefit could this person have from seven years here and how could this person uh, participate in seven years. So once you, um, it, it, for us to make it blind throughout, it really didn't make sense. But, but we we're really hopeful that this notion of the first round blind will create a kind of uh, equality of submission that, in a way, though we strive for it, it's, it, you know, when everybody's saying, oh, I know this writer from the get go, there is a sense of power, uh, additional power for the people. So just to give you an overview of what e realism is going to look like, I'll just talk you through that and direct you to the website. But first off, I just have to say it's so <coughs> thrilling for us to be going paperless. Our designers are actually calculating, they're trying to calculate how many tons of paper uh, we're going to save by doing this. And it looks like it's literally going to be tons. So actually tons. So we'll post that, I'm sure, on the website when we figure that out. But um, and also we gained a whole storage space in the basement that was not available. <laughs> <laughs> like over, you know, like 650 clicks. We, we, you know, the hard, yeah. Because yeah. we, we, we get about 325 oh. applications, two plays each. So about, we had two a shelf. Copies, 1300. Okay, great, right, exactly. Mm -hmm. math. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, a lot of things. So the, the, all those shelves now are being used to Way, this building doesn't have storage space, so that was like really an extraordinary um, discovery. Yeah, it's pretty thrilling. So, so um, here's how it's going to work. You're going to go to our website. Um, the window will open as you said on August 1st, and uh, you'll go to gcompass.org. You'll click on admissions, and you will uh, be prompted to create a username and a password. So you do that, you'll get an email at, um, at the email, sorry, not a password, I, I skipped ahead. You'll be prompted to give a username and your email address. So you'll then receive an email, and uh, that will prompt you to create, go to the website, create your password, and you're in. And you have the entire window to complete your application. You can wait, you can uh, start it, you can save it, you can discover, oh, actually, I want to work on my statement a little bit more, I'm going to come back and then paste it in, that sort of thing. Uh, you cannot make any alterations to any part of your application, however, once the window closes at 11.59 p.m. on September 1st. So you do have that whole window uh, to go back and, and make changes, but just make sure you don't leave it the whole last second and it cuts you off because that will be a very hard deadline. Uh, so, as Emily was saying, as Tom was saying, you know, materials are all the same with the exception of the letters of recommendation. You're submitting the exact same thing that you've applied before that you've always submitted. It's just all online. So you'll be entering your contact information, verifying that you're a U.S. citizen or have INS uh, work authorization. You'll be uh, pasting in your statement of interest. You can actually type it in there or you can just paste in from a text file, be uploading or um, pasting in your bio or CV or resume, whichever you prefer. We only need one, so just pick whichever one seems the most applicable to you. And then you'll, um, yeah, that, the statement was for, yeah, for that. And then, um, and then uh, you'll be uploading, 
each of your plays by picking the titles for us, and you'll have a chance to review all of it, see if it all looks good to you. Uh, when you are sure that you're ready to submit it, you'll click submit, and you'll receive an email that actually uh, gives you through a quick, brief overview of the things Claude was mentioning about the process, that there are three rounds of reading, um, you know, about when you'll be hearing, and that sort of thing, that your news is going to use basically as you proceed in this process. And there'll also be a link uh, in that email so that you can do your application for the future should you want to look at it. But you cannot make changes. Um, you can't go back and put a new version of your play and you're locked in um, with what you've submitted and your closes. So it should be hopefully really, really easy, um, really, really simple. Uh, Morgan Allen has actually put together a little video. If you go to the site right now um, and, <laughs> and look at the admissions page, you'll see text that sort of covers all these changes and what we've been talking about. You'll see um, the guidelines that you can upload and look at, or download, I should say. And then you'll also see a video that Morgan put together that will show you a pretty good approximation. We're still making a few tweaks and changes but a pretty good approximation of what you'll see when you actually go through the process. Any questions about your votes? So great, thank you. I feel like um, now's the time to open up for questions and see what other kinds of conversation um, that stimulates. Again, you know, John, as he said, he's the director of the Playwrights Lab. Um, I just hope I can say this, that before he was on staff here, he did spend uh, a short period of time in the on the admissions committee, <coughs> and then Daniel, um, who understands it will be uh, that it's that he has been on the admissions committee. When we won't say because the, the actual identities of the committee remain confidential um, throughout. We always tell the members that they can out themselves, but they cannot out their fellow committee members. <laughs> and to um, so, um, but they have you know unique points of view because they've actually been. In the trenches with this particular process, um, as well as just being knowledgeable about uh, you know, all the way we got this works from a player's point of view, from a lab point of view. So, what's in your mind? What don't you know? <laughs> yeah. So each each panelist will get one play to begin with. Is your, is your play going to be written by only one person at first? So if you just miss the connection. And there might be somebody else on the panel who might have connected and it's just random in that sense? We do stipulate randomly, um, but uh, there's that, yes. So the chances are that, it's that we will likely go into the first meeting with one play read by one committee member, possibly two, depending on whether or not somebody from within the community advocated in favor of your to play the two plays being read. But say yes, for the audience <coughs> purposes, one of your plays will be read by one committee member, but and they will bring their response to your play to the discussion in January. So no one person actually holds the authority over an individual applicant. All of the um, people who oh they make a recommendation on your play to re to reject at this point in the process or to advance. So if you receive a rejection your play would be brought to discussion in that first meeting in January. Any play that has received a recommendation for rejection will be brought to that meeting and will be discussed amongst the group. Within the group, and it's often happened, I will say, that the description of the material is such that the, another committee member might say, oh, that's really intriguing to me. That uh, It sounds like a play I would like. I like to read that play at which point your recommendation is suspended, your play will get circulated to the volunteer and your other play will get circulated to a different reader. Um, and so we'll get some more reads on it and then it will be brought back for discussion in that mid-March meeting, the second meeting. So that's... Uh, the other thing that often happens with rejections, especially in the first round, because, um, the, you know, First of all, it's important to know that five of the seven people who are reading are writers. So they're playwrights. So it, it A means they're wildly sympathetic, and B it means they're wildly committed. <laughs> and inevitably what happens is that um, they will, if they don't like something, 
they will say something like, well, maybe I just don't get this. Or maybe this, this isn't my cup of tea. Maybe somebody else should read it. This is the thing about discussing really at great length every play that is read. And we, we discuss every read on every play. Um, so there are so many ways that can go. And yet, yes, there is still a chance that based on one random assignment of reading, you might get rejected. If a play gets advanced, then it continues to circulate even in that first round. And I will also say, just even up to put a finer point on this um, playwrights revealing their own limitations, they often do that in their reports because Aaron and I have really encouraged them to let us know sooner rather than later where their biases are, where their limitations are, to ensure that that person gets read thoroughly. So now we do have often have the writers or, or the committee members saying, I don't get this early on. I need somebody else to read it. Or can I read their other play because I'm just I'm not I can't hear the voice, or it's not clear to me, and I really want to. And I would say that they often err on the side of generosity because of, of being aware of their own limitations, biases, sensibilities, um, or they'll ask if somebody else can. And we often do that in the first round as, as best that we can to make sure that it, again that conversation in January has as much information as we can know at that point in the process. And I just have to say that uh, when I was put in, so this was a little over eight years ago, um, I had already read 40 plays before they hired me. <laughs> so they couldn't just kick me out. <laughs> so what they did was they actually brought in someone else and, and he continued to read that for, in that for that first round. We both came to the meeting, I had my input and then I was cycled off the committee. But I was actually, I was surprised in that first uh, meeting how many plays were actually <coughs> There was always someone on the committee who said, oh, well, well that sounds really interesting. I really, want to, I really want to read either that play or I want to read the play. So, but it was great to see that the care and the, the true interest for every play that had been read and so the, when, when the discussion came around, there was there was great attention paid to each of the plays, and a lot a lot more plays than I presume uh, were actually or writers were put back into circulation because someone on that committee found something uh, of worth in what the just the, the, the conversation was around that play or and that writer, and so a lot of plays actually went back into circulation there. So uh, I just thought it was a really fair way. It clearly wasn't just one read and, and the check, and then that was it, and we tossed off the end that. It was a great consideration. It's interesting because early on in the process, I think, too, people are a little, much more tentative about their judgments. And so, and they're not as beaten down yet. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so, there is a sense in that first meeting that that is, that is actually not a bad place for there to be that readiness. Um, but again, you know, uh, just to reinforce, uh, last year's finalist is this year's first round rejection, and last year's easy rejection is now a number of dramatists because uh, it, there is that level of readiness, especially in the first round, or two rounds, and also, you know, different dynamic Yeah, I think that there's a lot of people who are really interested in the felt like you were going to get from the contest and then whether any of that changed or surprises about what you used to find yourself in. Uh, when I first applied, it was many years before I finally got in, and the organization had changed certain things, that it had become, uh, in the last seven years, it's been more vital than I think it's ever been. I think that I can say what I was saying. For me, it was very, very, it was, there, there have been so many new opportunities or the players here than there had ever been. So, uh, it, it, I was, it was more than what I expected because new programs and new opportunities were coming out every year. So, in that sense, it shifted my, my uh, sense of what the organization was. It was very different from when I first started to apply and when I got in for the last seven years. And still to all. So in that sense, it wasn't necessarily what I thought it would be. I mean, we would have had a lot, but it was 
Well, just, and what specifically did you use it for? I, I use building practically every, every day. Not every day, but every week. I was in the building. And earlier in, in my tenure here, the building was fairly empty. And I could go upstairs and be alone on a Saturday. Right? And I lived two blocks away, so it's kind of horrible. But I just. <laughs> 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 um, I really used it. I utilized the building. That's the first thing I did. And then I became. I wanted to be making on. I did all the programs, I did all the opportunities that were offered. And uh, so I did playtime, I, I, I got a travel grant, I was in the executive committee, I was on the board of directors. I tried to do everything, and I think that's really important to utilize as much as possible. Did your laundry here? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was my <laughs> Literal laundry, not dirty. <laughs> That's why I joined. <laughs> uh, but specifically, I can tell you what the interesting was, but overall, everything that I could possibly take advantage of, I did because it's there to be taken advantage of. It's there to be every, everything you can apply for, everything that you can do, every, every, every workshop, every meeting. I, mean, I, I just tried to do this. I think I was very active. Some people were getting more active than others. Proximity, uh, all kinds of things. Did that answer your question? Yes. I was just going to, because earlier today we um, held an orientation for uh, five of, of the six new writers who were named last minute. So I was, and one of the things that's on my mind, especially apropos of what Dan had just explained, was that we uh, talk about the writers coming in as the artistic directors, or the leaders of their artistic trajectory over the seven years here. And so really to take the lead in um, how they develop their work, what, what they're developing, when they develop it, how and with whom. And so to really, to really find that leadership position within your own artistic development. And I just want to say that you know, Dan was an exemplary um, representation of that because he led his artistic development privately within, you know, behind closed doors, exploring the same play over, um, you know, individual working sessions to finding what it means to look to uh, develop a play within a workshop, a three to five day workshop, to hold soirees where he invited people to come in and help him think about a project that he was um, interested in working on to, again, the sort of writer's executive committee, the board of directors, showing up for all writers meetings, showing up for other writers. I mean, so, and then just most recently, really, really um, innovating a new kind of work, which was through, if you want to describe it, but through uh, improvisations and writing in response to improvisations with actors within the concentration of the three to five day workshop. And it was so, really, that's the kind of opportunity. And so the way he found his way through is not necessarily the way another person would find through, but that is a very individualized kind of um, evolution of an artist and a leader within the world of the with the resources that we offer. It's interesting, we have, meeting, um, we, we have like, semi-regular check-ins with the writers as a staff, as an artistic staff, <coughs> but both to make sure they understand what's here for them, and then to make sure they understand they only have two years left, and they better not make here. And we had one of these fifth year meetings, so a week or so ago. Um, I say parenthetically that one of the great things about being on staff at, at Madromics is since we didn't create this place, and it is not an extension of anyone's individual vision, we can sort of brag about how cool it is. We can stop bragging about ourselves. And one of the things that he said was, he said, you know, when he got in here, he was aware that it was a, the thing that he was supposed to check off of his professional resume. It's like, okay, got, got the Guggenheim, got into the O'Neill, got into New Dramas, you know, whatever, production hat. And, um, and what he realized very soon, through, mostly through the guidance of other writers, was that it's, it, it, I'm putting words a little in his mouth, that it's a sort of box of gifts that you open them over time, and you just think about, I mean, Daniel's class, 
um, it, uh, was Lucy Thurber, Kiara Ruiz, Marcus Garvey, and Ali Manich are all amazing writers and amazing human beings. And so just those five writers together, let alone the other 45 or the other the additional 50 that passed through during Daniel's time, um, just gives you a sense of those gifts in addition to that, those programmatic opportunities that he's talking about. Oh, okay. Uh, well, okay, so let's go Tammy and then um, Rob. Rob, thank you. <coughs> Um, could you talk a little bit about the out of town playwright sure. coming in Great. and that's the um, question. Great. Okay. <laughs> 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 I got your plug in. <laughs> They have access to all the same resources as anybody within the community. There, there's no separation or hierarchy depending on location. But what we do ask the out-of-town um, writers to address is how do you, from where you are, participate in a community, in a, a vibrant, vital, artistic community of other playwrights. And so each person really addresses that according to where they are. Um, we've had great, we have some national members now, I will say Eugenie Chan, Peter Nocri, Carlos Marie, all of whom live, two live in the Bay Area, Peter and, and Eugenie, and Carlos lives in Chicago, and they're as active as anybody in the building, and to some degree, because they have very uh, discreet amounts of time that they come into the dramatists, they end up you know, coming in for two weeks and doing everything they can do, whether it's an extended workshop and individual readings and going to see other people's work, they often, you know, concentrate their visits around um, our all writers meetings, of which we have two: one in the fall, following the new playwright welcome in September, and then one in the spring, following the annual luncheon fundraiser big event in May, we have the second all writers meeting. So often their trips do um, cluster around those two big events. Uh, but people use it, it's a lot of people will come in for short periods of time more frequently, some a few extended periods, but they make the efforts based on their own schedules and needs and try to do everything they can do in those periods of time. Um, we have three rooms upstairs right, that are free you. for them. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and some of our in-town writers use them too for retreats from the families or um, but people come in, they can stay in the building up to three weeks, they can use it as their um, home, they can make their own coffee in the morning instead of waiting for agents to do it. Mm -hmm. There's a kitchen too, so, so they really can. Yeah. And so some do it, some do it to develop work, some do it uh, around those meetings, and some do it just to hang out in the York for two weeks. Um, oh, 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 another sure. follow-up question, how, how does that impact um, being out of town um, applying? Are there like number of in town versus out of town? Is it more competitive? Or, uh... Well, we do. Uh, it's really not discussed. Mm -hmm. uh, candidacy issues, which is, would include location of where someone lives, mm -hmm. aren't discussed until about halfway through that third meeting, right? Where we look at those those various things. Uh, and one of the mandates from, and as Todd said, you know, we we always bring in recommendations from staff in terms of resources. <coughs> Uh, how we'll do and how many you know can we support this year? But the mandate from the writers was really to um, because a couple years ago we found that it was almost 50-50, mm -hmm. but sort of it had just accrued that way that there were 50 percent in town and 50 percent out of town, and they really asked us to be mindful of you know two thirds in town, one third out, just to ensure that there's a certain kind of vibrancy and vitality within the building and presumably people in town use it more. Like I said, I really, with the particular people who right now are national members, they are very much a part of the community and use it really dynamically. Um, it just happens to be that way. But, uh, but that's sometimes, how sometimes they move. So Melanie Market, she yeah. started, she's in dance class, started as a local person. Mm -hmm. But actually she started in Minneapolis, moved to New York, and then moved to LA. Other people have moved to New York during it. Some have even stayed. 
stayed in New York in order to have the time. Thanks. Uh, is the reading committee interested in seeing works that we know still have, have some development need to be done on them, or do you want to see pieces we think are finished, finished, finished? There, uh, again, there because there is no reading committee, uh, there is no answer to that. Right. I mean, the answer is um, uh, one that changes from year to year. Um, I would say that it is hard for um, unfinished work or, I mean, who knows what I'm finished, what's finished. But for, um, you know, really rough first, writers will know if it's a first draft. Right, right. You know, the other writers will know. Um, it's hard for that to compete with the best that's out there. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so I think, and, and again, yeah, but again, um, people are looking for the writer through the work. It's not always easy to do even for playwrights. Um, they still get stuck on the play, so um, you know I, I, I don't I don't. It's never easy to answer that question because it depends on who gets it. It depends on what the state is. You might have you know what it's like. Sometimes you write a new play, you love it more than anything you've ever written, and two years later you think it's dread, or you love it for a reason because it is just alive with something new in you. Um, and that will communicate. And so, I mean, I don't know. Maybe other. I would just ask Dan maybe to you know. speak from inside the process. What did, what 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 got you excited? I mean, yeah, let me run a minute. It's. Want to speak to Rob's question? Yeah. Well, what got me excited was it's all. To replay some time, I did replay, but I, I didn't respond to it. Um, but what I responded to was work that spoke to me, and also even if it just didn't speak to me, it was a different point of view that I could really appreciate it. There are a few plays I remember that were very different from the I would normally think I would want to see, or that I really liked reading. Mm -hmm. I could actually say, yeah, I would have been that way, and I did. So it was on a play-by-play -play basis. I can't really answer what, what, what spoke to me. What spoke to me is what would speak to me anyway, pretty much, mm -hmm. um, with varying degrees of interest. There's In terms of time. finished or unfinished, does, did um, that ever sort of influence you one way or the other? I can't really say no. I can't say that. Did. I don't really remember reading plays that were remarkably unfinished or that seemed that they were promising but not there yet. Mm -hmm. I suppose there were, but I don't remember. I suppose that would have made an impression on me. I actually have a, a response to that, just as, as a committee member. Mm -hmm. I'm not even sure that I actually uh, would have even thought of that, the answer to that, or my response to it is purely subjective. Mm -hmm. But when I was on the committee, and, and again, you know, as a staff member, I have nothing to say, but when I was on the committee, I remember reading Lewis Martin writer, and I read the, the A play, I thought it was fabulous. I thought it was flawed, but fabulous. So I asked to read the B play. And then the second play was flawed, but fabulous. And so what I thought was, I'm not sure that this writer is, is someone who might want to come in here, although I thought I thought he was a really terrific writer, he was really great stuff. And so having sort of been a, you know, I, I also have now over 25 years or so in the theater, I've worked with writers who have really great, really good writers, but actually don't know how to go back and sort of do what, write a, 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 what I would call a proper way mm -hmm. of play, where it's more than a few words of work. And again, this is, <laughs> it's, this is me, very subjective, but I can see that if I were on the committee and I saw two plays that were sent in that were, this is your, my A play and this is my B play, and again, you know, What's finished? I mean, I, I I agree with that, and I think that I'm giving a lot of leeway there. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me that if what you're doing is putting out your best work, then you don't want to put in something that you don't feel is, is finished because you have no idea who's reading it, you know, no idea who's going to be generous and who's not going to be generous. And so, and then and the rest you can't do anything about. You go out there, you do your best, and that's that's that. But if you if you feel that you actually have not finished the play, 
I would suggest maybe you want to send it to you for the, the most minister. Mm -hmm. uh, I do remember something. Uh, one play uh, was great. It was one very, really, really exciting and just really confrontational. It was great. And the second play really did feel like a really play it was. It was a play that was not nearly on the same level and it was very clear to everybody. Um, but that was also kind of taken into account that the one play was so strong and the other one wasn't, but it was a really good play. So, um, the way that you just, you know, and then, then there's another instance where I read a play and I thought, this is a great play, I loved it, I advanced it, and then I was given a second play and I could believe it's a same writer. Mm -hmm. It was just so lacking in the book, often, as far as I was concerned. Mm -hmm. It seemed like there were two <coughs> writers. I think this notion of the relationship between the two plays comes up a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I think you're also right, you are uh, addressing with your submission of so even though there are five writers, they are actually from different generations of the theater. And then we rotate those other two positions. You know, like one year it'll be a designer and an actor, and next year it'll be a dramaturg and a director or something. Mm -hmm. And they may come from very different aesthetic backgrounds. And often with, for example, producers who are on the committee, they are, it's harder for them actually to read past the play to the writer. Whereas a writer might, and this is gross generalization, um, <laughs> you know, the, a writer might be much more in tune with voice and, uh, you know, the excitement of voice. So that mentioned. The other thing that I would posit almost as a, an opposite extreme is um, to submit your most well-known or well-produced play from 1993. So what inevitably happens is um, there are people who submit an old play that they know is their best play mm -hmm. or a really good play. And inevitably, certainly by the end, people are going to say, well, we know this play. This play's been around for 20 years. What, what is the writer doing now? How can we make an evaluation based on this play that was, you know, done for man in 1987, if there was even in that this one mm -hmm. um, Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think these are, in a way, they are the poles that you're navigating between when you submit, between the thing that new, is new and you are alive with and is finished, and the thing that's finished and tested and true. And ideally, you have two things that are somewhat closer to finish and open as in different ways. I have an online question, and then I can see that there's two from Tom and Claude. Um, what is it? Julia. Julia, thank you. So, um, online. Okay, so it says, are you open to new forms, play with songs, audio play, dance, text, site-specific, etc., both in terms of submissions and working on once you're a resident? Okay. Um, um, uh, or vice versa. Mm -hmm. Oh, you can do that. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you take it? Uh, yes. I mean, that's, I think that um, we have uh, often received you know, plays with songs. Uh, I think that what ultimately um, needs to be delivered is something that is assessed by a committee of seven people who, who again, who are intuiting you um, as an artist. I think that it's, it's often hard to assess something that requires the collaboration of other people in order to have it fully realized when it's in, in, a, in a reading form. It doesn't mean that they wouldn't be interested in it, it, would, it just would be more difficult. I mean, as it's come up in the past, it's sort of like, this is really interesting. I think it needs three dimensions to be fully, um, to fully experience it. And so sometimes that's a hard thing to assess in a committee of seven people. For example, if it's a, you know, if it's a site-specific, you know, arguably the a primary part of the dramaturgy is the site. So how, how does a, a committee of readers assess that in relationship to other things that what might still be experimental are still largely text-based? However, once you, once you come in here, we have people who are working in very experimental ways, whether it's, you know, devising work or with companies or with movement theater 
um, and then exploring the various kinds of dramaturgy that um, and we can definitely support that with the, um, the space and the resources here. So um, that's what I would say. You know, once at, once you're at, in New Dramatis, once you have gone through the, that admissions process, and you know, that in terms of what you work on and how you work here is support, supported fully. I mean, if people have asked about something as you know conventional as screenplays, and many writers because uh, you know find themselves at a period of their time where they're writing screenplays, you we can help support those readings here or. Um, so, so yeah, once you're here, that's the easy part of the answer. It, the harder part is to answer how that goes through an admissions process. But um, we do the best that we can. We try to have people on the committee who are working in unique ways in order to be able to continue to broaden the kind of work that can be supported here, you know, the playwright and or author, some of the authors work in three dimensions. I hope that was Please uh, follow up if, if that wasn't clear. Yeah, I, I think Emily said it exactly. Um, so the only thing I would add would be a, a reiteration, but I, I guess I want to underline one part of it, which is you know we have and have had um, writers of all stripes here. We have you know several writers um, uh, who essentially self-produce or work with the company currently: Taylor Mac, Rich Maxwell, Young Jean Lee. We've had wildly experimental writers here, um, experimental opera uh, writers, um, and uh, and yes. So the the hardest thing is convincing the panel who does not have that other dimension, and the easier thing is supporting the work here. Um, additionally, I guess the one thing I would add to what Emily said is that we've been confronting this as a organization and as a community, especially for the last um, decade or so, because New Dramatis, which comes out of a very different tradition of people sitting around tables and then later adding music stands for the developmental work, now is a community of people who are, you know, a playwright fight director, someone who does, who sings and does drag and writes plays, people who work with choreographers, people who work with innovative forms and so on. And so our job as an organization, as a staff, with that separate from the playwrights, is how to create spaces that can support work that involves projections, sound design, choreography, light um, rehearsals, you know, in a space that's basically this small space where we're now an upstairs larger sanctuary of a, of a church, um, that are basically bare strip stage spaces with tables, chairs, music stands and pianos. So we're working to create more flexible spaces, movable um, audiences so we can play environmentally, adding sound equipment, adding lighting, lighting equipment, which used to be anathema in the old days because it's all about the text. The text now means so much more. It has for a long time, but we've been exploring what that means in a developmental organization. So that's uh, another part of the answer in terms of when people get here we're trying, and as the community evolves, we try to evolve the resources around. Julia and then Tom. Yeah, actually that was mostly a question about you have a follow-up sure. one, which is um, when you have to decide on your A and your B playing, um, sure. if folks oh, say you did very external writing, for example, um, and one looks a little bit more like a normal play, <laughs> though it falls apart at the end. <laughs> But you're not, you're talking hypothetically. I'm talking hypothetically. I'm just saying, clearly, I'm going to say that I'm having one. Um, would that be a better A play than the one that starts in the, let's call it more experimental <laughs> place? I just want to say, to, to, and this comes up every year, that it is impossible for you to second guess the committee. Yes. I mean, it, because it changes every year, I mean, I can't even. Guess where all where, where they will end up. So all you can do as applicants, potential applicants, is to go with what you feel represents you the best, and hope that there is somebody on that committee that gets it, interprets it, and persuades the entire you know the other six people that that this is this is somebody to be reckoned with. And 
in that final, if not in the class that they select. Do you know, I, I really feel like I want to, you know, you cannot second guess where, where they will go. And um, so the way I feel like the best thing you can do for yourself, so you're not second guessing your choice, is to go with what you feel the most strongly about, what you're on fire about, and hope that that ignites a community of people. Honestly, it is, it is the only thing, because you could sit and fuss about, okay, A or B, A or B, and then you'll make the choice, and then say, hypothetically, you don't get it, and you'll be like, oh, that B play should have been my play, or whatever. You just torture yourself, and really, it's to, um, to reduce that, is just to go with what, you know, because if you're, you want to get in based on who you are, not, you know what I mean? Not what you're trying to appeal to a committee. And our job is to make sure that the committee, again, is as wide a readership as we can possibly get in seven people. Which is a hard situation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a hard situation. Um, because um, I, I'm just, you know, um, I, I, I wish I'm more exper experienced in writing more highly terminal stuff that doesn't have people attached to blah, blah, blah. My more experimental for me play is one that actually looks more. Do you know what I'm saying? It's an odd situation, but it's also my most recent thing. So it's kind of like I'm just trying to figure out which one is represented. Can I answer that? Yes, please, 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 please. Right. Yes. I think that's what Emily said. But the committee is what do you feel most strongly about what you're trying to do? Yes. That what do you feel? What do you feel is your right? I guarantee you'll know which is your right. Exactly. It's so instinctive. Don't trust me, so you can't second guess. If no one knows what counts, you're going to know. Tom, thank you, Julian. So I'm supposed to start this together a sense of how the players move through the process. And I understand now that when they have the first grade meeting, where they do the narrowing down to the semi final with 11 players, well, we have to be read by one person, we have to describe them and talk about it, and some questions from the other six people. But when, is there a point in the process where that needed so planned that I'll pass somebody's work and start like everybody in the That happens in the finals. Uh, at the, in the final round, the, in the first round, it, we just to really boil it down to the numbers, is that in the first round, every play that should be read will have, it, have been read by at least one person. Okay, so that's the sort of first round, what we consider the first round. The eight ones. Well, every play that needs to be read will be read by at least one person. So, again, it might be your A and B play, depending on whether or not that advocacy comes through the, you know, someone um, within the Obama's community, current or alumni person, right? But I said, yes, your A play will be read by one person. And then if you are recommended for rejection, you will be discussed at that first meeting, okay? Anybody who has received a recommendation for advancement will continue in the process. Does that make sense? So for the second round, the, the committee reads 10 plays every two weeks until each applicant has, you know, maybe four different readers on, uh, on their work. So it might be two readers on their A play and two readers on their B play. And the, the, set, the reason for that is so that there's more conversation around the person at that second meeting in order to uh, come up with a list of finalists. Because the work of that second meeting is to come up with a list of finalists. And then anybody who is remaining as a finalist at the end of that second meeting, 15 hours later, I'll add again, um, mm -hmm. that uh, everybody reads both plays for that final meeting in May. And then everybody's work is discussed by everyone, with the exception of the staff who <coughs> facilitate the process. So is that clear? Is that clear? Great. Okay, go ahead, James. Uh, does the committee look for a similarity in tone with play A and play B? Um, you know, that is, um, uh, again, there is no committee. So, <laughs> uh, and everybody is going to respond to that differently. And, and again, I mean, I think this is what Emily said is really profound about, you know, they're looking for who you are. You know, so there are writers whose plays all have a similarity in tone. And they go deep into one thing. There are writers who are wildly eclectic even within their bodies of work. And that's what's so amazing about them. Um, and so what the work of the committee is, um, is to discern the writer. 
that you know the best of that writer and whether the best of that writer at this moment is strikes on the box at this moment, you know. Um, and so, uh, and then how they make that discernment is anybody's guess, and it's different for every person. So some people may hold it against you that your plays sound alike, and others may think this is a mature writer who knows what he's about at this moment, you know. And then there may be a huge leap, you know. I think about somebody like Lucy Gerber who just uh, finished with Dan here, whose early plays were really about peace. They were on the same location, the same sort of intimate naturalism. And then at one point in her time here, she started writing these plays that just were huge and different, and the scope was different, and the kinds of characters were different. Um, and I can imagine her applying at that moment to break. And that would have been a very different candidate than the one who submitted two plays that were, you know, almost simultaneous and certain, uh, certainly congruent in that way. So that's a non answer answer. I'm going to go to Nostrum, and then I think we probably have time for maybe one more, and certainly, I mean, I'm just respectful of everybody's time where we need to go, and then we can certainly hang out and answer individual questions as well. But for the group, Nostrum. Hi. Um, I, I wonder if you could tell me just about new, new dramatists, like what does the executive committee do, and like what, like if I had a play and I wanted to do a two-week workshop, could I do that here and then have like a presentation or two at the end of it? Or, um, you know, like if there was an amazing book that I thought was everybody should read, could we like get together and talk about it? You know what I mean? Like, are those all options? Oh, no. Well, first, I, we should separate the executive committee and the process. Oh, the executive committee has their. I know. Okay. Yeah, no, I know. I'm just wondering what it is. Okay, go ahead. Well, I'll, I'll skip the executive committee because we'll talk about that. But, but I mean, in essence, when we when we when we talk to the new writers who come in, we say, think of this place as a laboratory. So, sort of, the answer is kind of yes, 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 and yes to everything you ask. <laughs> except, doesn't except, okay. uh, uh, you know, I mean, so that if you actually want to come in, we, we don't do two week workshops because part of it is, you know, sort of. Uh, what we do is we can do a 29 hour reading next so we can do three to five day workshops. Um, so, and in fact, the, the programming here has expanded. The time I've been here has been a huge expansion of programs. And without going through all of them, but we now can do the three to five day workshops where we actually pay everybody. We follow Equity's 29 hour uh, reading so that uh, basically no actors call more than 29 hours. Everybody gets paid 75 bucks a day to participate in that. And so it's a way for us to actually, and in fact, they're probably making more money than they would have paid when they make $400 a week. But anyway, so they do it all. <laughs> 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 I, I know. Oh, right. 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 <laughs> for example. Uh, okay. But anyway, the point is, is that we actually do pay everybody. But, but so yes, yeah, so you can do a three to five day workshop. Um, you can, we also, you, you can bring the same piece over and over again, so you don't, we don't want you to feel like, like you, like, you being the artistic director of your process means that if you wanted to use new dramas to come in and just kind of uh, hear how your place sounds in different voices, so we can bring in a bunch of actors for, for a reading for one or two day workshop, one week, and then bring in a different bunch of actors, so you actually get a sense of, what does my place sound like in the, in the mouths of different different people? Whatever it is that you can imagine, we can imagine together. We can do. So if you want to bring in, if, if there's a book that you actually want to do that you want to adapt, you know, we can sort of figure out how you actually work around that process to what what is going to be most effective for you to sort of go to the next level in development of, of that process. <laughs> so we will try to bring in those collaborators and help you bring them in. And, so sort of, it, it's always a conversation. So we do it together. We bring in we can help with actors, directors, um, you know, depending on what it is, designers, dramaturgs, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the point is, we really do want you to think of this place as a laboratory. That you can come in and really experiment with your work and, and um, yeah, uh, uh, 
come in, the same piece can come back and you can, you can look at it from different angles. You can, you can, you know, just work on a few scenes if you want this week and then come back next week and work on a full act or, you know, just look at the physical life of the play. If that's what you're some of to explore, you just do three scenes to work on the physical life and whatever, you can do that. And then come back again later and then do it more, a, a bigger uh, reading that you may want to do when you feel the play is ready. So you can do a big public reading, you can do a lot of clothes, private, you know, informal workshops and readings. Does it happen often? I just want to interject one quick thing that has to do with your question about the book, and it also is sort of it goes back to Tammy's question about national um, uh, residency. But for example, I mean, you could ask everybody to read the same book and talk to you about it, or you could sort of say onto a listserv that's a very active listserv that also engages the entire community, local and nationally. I just read this book. Has anybody read it? Because I need to have a conversation about it. You know, in and then do something, you know, meet me in the building at a bagel and break out on Thursday morning at 10, I've got to talk to somebody. You know what I mean? So that's another just sort of yes question. It's, it, you know, I'm just not sure. It's, uh, we just spent two and a half hours orienting the five of the six million people. And that was the tip of the iceberg. It's a really simple place in terms of its mission. It's really complicated in terms of how people use it. Um, but I, I just want to see if I can sort of in response to your question, in addition to what John and Emily have said, you, you come in here for seven years. You're an artist, you're a human being, you're a professional, and you're part of a community. And all of those strands are ways of using this place. So one of those is I'm a person who lives in uh, you know, Decatur, and I need to I need a place to stay to be in New York to meet my agent and my friends. Uh, part of it is I'm a developing artist, and so I want to work on musical level, work with directors, I want to work with actors, and I've got these three different plays in the United States as well, and do that. Part of it is I'm a member of a community, I really like to work with governments, and I really see myself as a future leader. So I want to be on this committee and this committee, I want to put myself up for board, lead, board uh, service, down the road, and part of it is um, those things are going to change over time. So all of those things are available to you here. Some are programmatically Prescribed, like we do 29 hour readings, we don't do two week workshops. Um, you can do an unlimited number of regular readings, and some of them are less prescribed, like um, anytime you want to read a book and hold a meeting, this is your place for seven years, so you can just invite people in. And you can invite your friends, or you can invite the other writers, or you can invite both. You can do it publicly. You know, so all of those things. So, so on one level, there are the programs. On another level, there's the kind of expansiveness of the lab that John was talking about. And on another level, is like, what do I need to do? What do I need to get? What do I need to be over these seven years to develop myself? And how can this actually really fluid organization with like really committed support and a mailbox for me and a few beds upstairs? How can I do that? Yeah. Feel free to, um, if there are things that occur to you, to get in touch with us, if there are any clarification, if other questions come up. But for now, thank you for coming and for your interest and for your questions. And thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you.